as we get started, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we're happy to answer, you know, just type in the chat box, raise your hand, um, and we'll try to get to everybody's questions as we go along. Um, today we are talking about uh, the news of fake news. Um, so the term fake news gets thrown around a lot. Uh, and in kind of modern speak, it can mean anything um, from the intentional spread of misinformation, or even as our current president uses it, which is just news you don't particularly like. Um, but fake news is actually a misnomer for a much larger information literacy problem. And uh, not many students rely on fake news, per se, uh, but they do use poor information sources they find online. Uh, so over the course of this presentation, we're going to go over some common types of junk food information and low-quality resources we see students relying on in their papers and projects. Um, and we hope to see some, hear some of yours as well. Um, and at the end, we'll cover some simple things you can do to help your students be more information literate in this sort of messy digital age. So um, let's get started. So the first thing I want to note, which I kind of touched on just now, is that fake news is a symptom. So what do I mean by that? Um, acceptance of fake news shows a weakness in information literacy skills. Source evaluation is nuanced. It's complex, and it requires critical thinking skills that you that take time to develop and that you have to keep developing as you age and as you get older. And as new technologies and new publishing strategies come out, it's something that you have to keep up with. And um, one thing that kind of makes it hard for students to spend that time it takes to evaluating materials is that they lack domain knowledge to both seek out reliable information and fact check content they encounter. So we as educators need to work on teaching students how to identify good research analysis, how to identify good journalism, and by giving them the tools necessary to be confident researchers. And that's what we mean by giving them domain knowledge. And we'll touch on that, we'll circle back to that in the end. So over the next few slides, I'm going to go over some common pitfalls we see students making when searching online. Um, and the goal is to sort of give you an idea of what the fake news, I'm doing scare quotes so you can't see it, the fake news umbrella contains, and why it's not the most accurate way to name this particular lazy information consumption problem that we see among students. So keep in mind, too, that the types of resources we're about to go over are not mutually exclusive, nor are they the only types of bad or junk food content that we see, though they are some of the most frequent. So I'm going to go over a couple of these, and then Jenny is going to come in on the back end and give us kind of some actionable items we can use to sort of curb this lazy information pattern we see in our students. OK. So the first type of content I want to talk about that we see a lot of is something called native advertising. And I'm going to show you some examples of that in a second. Um, native advertising is the product placement of web publications. It is a type of online advertising that matches the form and function of the platform upon which it appears, usually with the specific intent to promote a product. A product. So um, the examples I'm going to show you, this first one from the New York Times, and the next one is from Forbes. Um, and, I'm telling you, and I'm showing you these because I want you to be aware that this is common across online publications, uh, even in print legacy news outlets and magazines. Um, so I've got two here that I want to show you. First is a good example of native advertising, and the next one's a bad example of native advertising. Neither should be necessarily used in a paper or project. Um, but I'm going to show you why how, how they differ. So first, I want to show you this first example of native advertising that showed up in the New York Times. Um, as you can see, it's an article about women inmates um, and why the male model for uh, incarcerating women doesn't necessarily work. Um, some things I want to point out right here at the top is that you'll see it's a paid post. Um, it's paid for by Netflix, 
and the purpose of this article is pr to pr promote the Netflix show Orange is the New Black. We also see over here it says Brand Studio. And in the URL, you can see that it's a paid post as well. Now, the reason I call this good native advertising is because the research is good. It's good journalism. They, um, they consult professional resources. They do interviews with professionals in the business. Uh, their statistics are good. Uh, the problem is it is paid for by Netflix, and there is a good amount of content in this article that promotes the TV show. Um, towards the bottom, they show some clips from the show, and then towards the bottom, they interview the woman who wrote the book that the show is based on. Um, so while some of the content is good, the purpose is not. The purpose is to sell you a product, which is this TV show. Um, so how I would tell students to approach a piece of native advertising like this is I would say, okay, you found some good information in here. What you might want to do instead is use this as a jumping off point. You like some of the things that they talked about. What you can do is you can follow up on the quotes. You can follow up on the resources. You can check the reference list at the bottom, see where they got their information, and maybe go directly to these sources for the information that you use in your paper. Now, this bad example of native advertising that I want to show you is from Forbes. Um, so like the article from the New York Times, um, they do indicate that this is native advertising, though they use something, uh, the terminology brand voice, which is really common among publications. They don't like the ad word, so they often call it like, you know, Forbes brand voice, IBM voice. Uh, sponsored content. They try to kind of wrap it up in a nice little bow. They don't outright say, this is an ad. Um, but this article, you'll notice, is um, it's written by somebody who works for IBM. Um, and if you click on these links in the article, Unlike the New York Times article where they were interviewing people, they were pulling from statistics from government sites, um, everything in here leads back to IBM services and products. They're only referencing themselves, and they're only promoting their own products. So really, they're not telling you anything about how to start a digital business or what to use. Um, they're basically just trying to sell you on things that they sell. So students, I wouldn't even tell students to use this as a jumping off point, because I think they can find stuff that's way better um, within our collection or even online. So those are two examples of native advertising. There are a couple of issues. Oh, I uh, just started hearing hold music in my telephone. Does anybody else hear that? OK. <laughs> Um, I promise I'm not going crazy. Sorry, that, I think that was me. Actually, I was trying to get myself off mute, and I put myself on hold. And sorry about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but I was just gonna just jump in. This is Jenny, by the way. Um, uh, just about the native advertising, um, and just to let you know how confusing this is when you talk to a student and you have them look at this example of that Lizzie has up of that Forbes article, and you ask them what the purpose is. They will say the purpose is to inform you, when really the purpose is to sell something because it's an advertisement. So. Um, that's just another way students kind of get confused when they look at this. They think it's an informational article, and again, it's native advertising. So just wanted to throw that out you out there. Oh, and that I'm really glad you brought that up because that kind of brings us back to this slide where um, so Stanford recently did a study where they uh, surveyed a bunch of students from middle school all the way through college and tested them on their media literacy skills. Um, and in their study, they found that nearly 80% of students cannot tell the difference between original news content and native advertising. And the examples that they were using, the native advertising um, was clearly marked. It said that you know brand content, paid posts, there were context clues that would that students should be able to pick on and tell that it's native advertising. But over 80% of students that they surveyed could not. And the reason why this is an even bigger problem is because 70, this Online Trust Alliance um, actually found that 71% of native advertising fails to provide adequate transparency best, 
based on FTC guidelines. So they looked at the top 100 um, news or websites uh, based on popularity and on search ranking. Um, and they reviewed them based on the FTC guidelines for native advertising um, transparency and found that 71% of them didn't meet the standards for identifying their advertising in their publications. So as you, you know, basically all of this is to say is that students have a hard time recognizing native advertising generally. Um, and then on top of that, publications uh, aren't doing their due diligence to mark advertising for what it is. So that's the first type of thing I wanted to go over. It's one we see a lot of, and I like to open with it because um, in the kind of changing digital age and how online economics works, uh, it's something for us all to be aware of and check out for. The next thing I want to talk about is something called reporting on reporting. Now, reporting on reporting uh, it's, this is sometimes called journalism or recycled news. Uh, it's a method in which news outlets beef up their content just by regurgitating another outlet's work. So um, this is basically where a, say a news outlet like The Blaze just picks up an article by Fox News who picked up an article you know, by another outlet and it's just recycling the same news over and over again. But none of these uh, news outlets have actually put in the investigative work. And this saves them money as they haven't invested in any original reporting. Um, and the ultimate goal of this is to reduce costs by cutting original news gathering, uh, which requires time and source checking. Um, and they can beef up their content um, and have more content on their site, which puts them higher in search results, and yada, yada, yada. Um, so I have an example here of what I'm talking about. Oh, I actually already have the link opened. So this article is from the Daily Cost. As you can see, the uh, headline here is, Donald Trump Jr. was paid $50,000 for a meeting to discuss U.S.-Russia cooperation in Syria. Now, based on uh, classic evaluating resources techniques that we teach our students, the student might approach this page and say, um, well, who is this hunter person? Um, are they a specialist in politics? Are they a seasoned political news analyst? Why doesn't Hunter have a last name? What is the daily cost? What is their leaning? Are they liberal? Are they conservative? What is their media bias? But by doing all of this, students are really wasting their time because all they need to do is scroll down and you can see in this first paragraph here where it says, a month before the November elections, Donald Trump Jr. attended a meeting in Paris to discuss the Syrian conflict and possible U.S.-Russian cooperation in the region. The Wall Street Journal now reports he was paid at least $50,000 to attend that meeting. Well, this article is just regurgitating the reporting that a Wall Street Journal uh, journalist has done. So what we do is we go and read upstream. We teach students to go to the original news source. And if you read this article, which we actually have full access to through the library, if you're unaware, uh, we have access to Wall Street Journal, so you can get beyond that paywall. But what we find here is that the Wall Street Journal originally reported this story. They reached out to Donald Trump Jr.'s team for a statement. Um, this doesn't go any deeper than that. But sometimes you'll come across an article like this Daily Cost. You'll go up to the Wall Street Journal article, and then you realize that they are reporting on uh, a piece of news that NPR originally published. So you would go upstream to that source. And so going upstream to the source may require many clicks. But here we come to this, and for students, a lot easier. it's a lot easier for them to say, oh, hey, the Wall Street Journal. This is something I'm familiar with. They have a history of journalistic integrity. They have an editorial board. Um, and then they haven't wasted all their time evaluating a less than stellar news source, because um, all they had to do was read up to the original source. And something else I like to point out with this particular article is that you can see how the headlines differ. 
even though all of this article is doing is reporting what they found here, the headline here says Donald Trump Jr. was likely paid at least $50,000. And the headline here says Donald Trump Jr. was paid $50,000, which is not necessarily the case. So um, that's just something to look out for as well. So that's what I mean when I say reporting on reporting. It's uh, kind of a lazy form of journalism. when We should really be teaching students to find that original news source, dig in, uh, and figure out where their information is coming from. Does anybody have any questions about that or about native advertising? Sorry, I didn't stop for questions earlier. So feel free to chime in at any time. I know it's a lot of talking here at the beginning. Um, the next thing I wanted to discuss is um, something called content farms. So. Um, a content farms are kind of the worst offenders for bulking up content on their website in an attempt um, to maintain a high search engine ranking. Uh, so a content farm is a website that contains a very large quantity of low quality or aggregated content. Um, and their main goal in life is clicks. They want clicks because that, they want that advertising revenue. Um, some ones you may be familiar with are Answers.com. Quora is one I see students using quite a bit, uh, as well as uh, Hub Pages. Um, and the reason we see students using content firms a lot is because they have so much information. They um, they cover so such a wide range of topic topics, and anybody can really post on them. You can write an article. You can be a contributor and they'll post your content. Um, and they're just really not appropriate for academic level work. Um, they're normally tertiary. They don't really tell you anything. A lot of times they're in list format. Um, but uh, some other things to watch out for, too, with content farms is they're constantly evolving. So Answers.com, actually, I don't think Answers.com as is exist anymore because they kind of got a bad reputation, right? So people would go to Answers.com and be like, oh, it's Answers.com, I can't use it. Kind of like uh, WebMD or something. You know, it got this bad reputation. So they spun off and now they put out a bunch of other websites all owned by Answers.com. They're all content farms, they just have different names. So one I see in business classes a lot is something called The Balance, which is like uh, their financial branch of Answers.com. Um, Thought Co. is another one that they publish, as well as the Spruce. So I don't know if any of you have come across these, these sources, but um, they can be really appealing to students because they aren't very in-depth, they cover a lot of topics, um, and they're easy to use. So kind of building off of this and related to this are something called contributor networks. So, and I wanted to specifically talk about contributor network, networks because they can be harder to spot. But contributor networks are when large publications use content farm strategies to bulk up their search engine optimization. So they're trying to put way more content on their site um, so they'll be more relevant. Um, so, and it also saves them a lot of money. Instead of keeping a lot of people on staff to put out content, an online publication will select contributions from freelancers who are often paid little or, in most cases, nothing at all. Uh, and they don't have to follow the same editorial guidelines that a journalist on their staff would. Um, they're generally, well, they are opinion pieces that aren't necessarily labeled as such. Uh, and students can often misrepresent that in the material in their papers and projects. Um, so some sites that I see that have really large, low-paid contributor networks are Forbes, Business Insider, Entrepreneur, and the Huffington Post. So um, a way to get around this, or what I like to tell students, is um, if you search for these, so say a student really likes using Forbes. There is some good content on Forbes. I know I pick on them a little bit. But they do have the occasional good article. Um, 
but they have a lot more coming out of their contributor network um, and coming out of their native advertising partners than they actually do from their on-staff journalists. So a way you can get around this is by searching for this stuff within the library collection because what we have cataloged within the library collection is from their print magazine. So it's not that online content that they're just pumping out every five seconds. Um, and I actually wanted to show you, I, um, I did a short, oh, I don't think I pulled it up. Apologies. Um, let's open this up. So if you do a search on Forbes, just for, let's say, new technology. You'll notice that under here, next to everybody's name, they say where they come from. So the first thing is we have a, a native advertising piece, a community voice piece, which is an area of their contributor network. So we have contributor, native advertising, more contributors, contributor, contributor. We haven't yet come to something that says Forbes staff. Um, so when you see something from Forbes, and it's by somebody actually on staff who they've invested time and money in, and whose work actually has to go through an editor, it'll say their name, and then Forbes staff. And they'll have a little check mark by it, like you see on Twitter, for a verified person's name. But as you can see, that's a really small amount of their online content actually comes from Forbes staff. There's, there's one right here. Um, so there's just something to be aware of. Um, it's a way for online news outlets to make money. Um, it's hard for um, news corporations to make money these days online. If they want to avoid a paywall, like something you see on New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, uh, they have to do stuff like this. And it stinks, and it tarnishes their brand. Um, but it also means that we have to be aware of it, and we have to teach our students how to be aware of it and not to use it when they see it. So I want to kind of run through this really quickly. Um, some other types of content that we see that you should be aware of is the general clickbait. Um, normally, if it has a leading headline like, you won't believe, or click on this for seven ways to clean the baseboards in your apartment, um, you know, it's probably attention grabbing. It's probably all you, all they want to click. The content most likely doesn't matter. Um, something I see a lot are listicles. Um, listicles is a great word. Uh, it's a portmanteau derived from the words list and article. So it is an article in list format. Oftentimes, it'll come in slides, so you have to do multiple clicks. Um, the information is normally short and out of context, um, and we don't really learn anything from it. Students just like it because uh, they can pull a quick quote on their topic, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they've learned anything because the content they're in is not nearly robust enough to use in a paper. Um, I also like I, the <laughs> The Wikipedia page actually says listicle. Some people have also said, suggested that it evokes the word popsicle, emphasizing the fun but not, nutrit not too nutritious nature of the listicle. So fun articles to read, but not exactly nutritious. Um, think of a BuzzFeed list is a good, ex good example of that. Uh, oh, and one more thing I wanted to talk about, too is user-generated content. I do want to make sure to note that um, not all user-generated content is bad. Uh, using user-generated content can be a great way to elevate marginalized voices or the views of those without access to traditional publishing methods. Um, so user-generated content um, can be useful. However, Many students have a hard time to know when and when not to use this type of content, and they tend to rely on these sources like blogs and 
uh, personal websites out of ease of use instead of what it might add to their paper or project or to whatever they're studying. So it's just something that we have to be aware of and watch out for. Um, and I'm, now I'm going to, now that I've given you all this stuff, I'm going to pass it along to Ginny, um, who is going to kind of cover what we can do about it. Because I know it's a lot of information, and I could throw things at you all day that students uh, give us in their papers and projects. But really, uh, the important piece of this is what we can do to help. So go ahead, Ginny. Great. Thanks, Lizzie. I love all of the examples that you show. It really helps us to see uh, what students are looking at, and and, and um, you know what I'm struck by is the that all of those examples um, were short, general articles uh, that basically had no information that you couldn't find a billion other places, and they just are not anywhere near the quality that students need to be using. Um, but we also know that recognizing poor quality information takes a lot of practice. Um, even though we've shown you some of these things today, you might not be able to spot them yourselves. Um, I, I get fooled myself. Um, so it does definitely take a lot of practice. And also the way the Internet works, it's always changing. So it's really difficult to spot new marketing practices, which may seem predatory. Um, but uh, one really good way to stop, spot poor information is by having a depth of knowledge on the subject. It's something that Lizzie mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation. And this is called domain knowledge. Um, but having domain knowledge happens over time. So it's really hard to do, especially our students coming in who are new to a certain program or discipline. But once you have a depth of domain knowledge, you will already know the major reputable publishers and ideas um, so that when you read something new, you can compare it to what you know about that domain. Unfortunately, many of us don't have a depth of domain knowledge in a lot of industries or subjects, so we're left really just evaluating information based on very little domain knowledge. So we have to educate ourselves in different ways um, by what you know Lizzie was telling us to recognize. Um, and this brings me to what can you do? Well, you guys are the domain knowledge experts. Um, so uh, the students are looking to you um, as the domain knowledge expert. And what you can do is several things for you students. Number one, give very clear instructions about what types of resources um, your students can use in your class, what types of resources they can use for um, the assignments. and give very clear expectations about the, what they can use. So um, make sure your students know what peer-reviewed or scholarly means. Um, in those instructions, if you say use two scholarly articles, they might not know what that means. So um, in your expectations, don't just tell them that, but in your instructions, define that for them. Um, go ahead and make sure they, they um, know what sources mean. So I know you might say scholarly articles, but if you just say sources, um, make sure that students know that they can use books or government publications or statistics and tables, those sorts of things. Also show them what they shouldn't use. So maybe even pull up a couple of these examples that we showed you today. Show them some general fluff articles that you won't accept um, as evidence for their uh, to supporting their ideas. Um, you might tell them not to use company marketing materials, uh, Q&A websites, and other websites that we've gone over today. Definitely show examples of types of resources that you do want them to use. Uh, maybe you can even point them to the library. Uh, show them a government agency or an association. As I said, if you're the domain knowledge expert, tell them where are the major places in your industry where you can get quality information. So if you're in the education field, uh, you might tell them to look at the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, the ASCD. So what are the major uh, bodies in your in, uh, industry or discipline? And share those with your students and make sure they know. Um, and then show, show them how to find information, too. So you can show them how you go um, to the library and find information, or um, sections of the newspaper, or certain types of magazines you like. Next slide. I have Lizzie driving the bus in her cube. So thanks so much. 
Um, so I really like this article from NPR that touches on horizontal reading and other strategies for reading like fact checkers do when they're reviewing information. And it's kind of um, is similar to what Liz, Lizzie was talking about with uh, reading upstream. But horizontal reading basically means opening the links to see exactly where the links are sending you. And that's what we were doing earlier. Um, so if uh, you open up an article, one of the first things you should be doing is opening up all the links. Instead of sitting there reading, um, instead of trying to figure out who the author is, um, go ahead and open up the links. Um, look at the original information and ask yourself if it was correctly passed on by your article. Ask yourself if it would just be better to just use the original information as a source. Lizzie's daily cost example um, showed that you should just go ahead and use that Wall Street Journal article instead of the daily cost article because uh, the daily cost article was short um, and it actually had some misrepresentations from the original source. Um, another thing that opening links can tell you is you might find the link um, going to an outside business page. Again, the example that Lizzie gave of the uh, Forbes article that just only linked to the IBM page um, shows what you might find. Another example I want to show is something that we didn't hit on, but it's the, um, Lizzie, you can go over to the amymyersmd.com uh, website. You might find that links in the article link to themselves. Um, so if you find a link here, Lizzie, as you scroll down, if you open it, you will find that those two, if you, you can even go up and just show them, they just link back to the, their own website. Um, so that should be a red flag to you and to your students. So in addition to horizontal reading, you might want to check the About Us page. I do say anything that you read on the About Us page, take with a grain of salt, uh, because it, you know, they can say, any, well, we've won you know, many prizes for uh, internet publishing, and we're super popular. We're the most visited website, or whatever. Uh, they can kind of say whatever. Uh, but you might want to look for disclaimers. Um, specifically about how transparent they are with their advertising. Um, definitely look at authorship, and what I mean by authorship isn't just the person writing the article, but it's the website authorship, and how reputable is that website, not just the article. Uh, look for editorial boards or other publishing rules. Um, and then go ahead and, and um, implement that by spot checking your student paper reference sections first. So um, look for commonly used poor resources. Um, as Lizzie mentioned, she sees a lot of balance. Uh, I see like Livestrong. I see um, several other ones. Autism Speaks. Uh, there's, there's quite a few. Quora. I see Quora a lot. Um, and you definitely want to follow up on unfamiliar sources. If you see something you don't recognize, go ahead check it out yourself, open up the, the website, or ask a librarian. And we are help, happy to help, um, help you identify reputable or high quality or low quality information that your students might be using. And I can go to the next slide. So what we really want is for um, instructors to hold students accountable to the expectations that you set forth. So earlier I was saying let them know what the instructions and the expectations um, are. But uh, after you do that, hold them accountable. Um, lessen the focus on APA and grammar. It certainly is important, but really what you want to focus on is the content. I know it's easier to focus on APA and grammar. It's much easier to check and send something back. But focusing on content takes a little more time. But if you uh, look at the reference sources, and you uh, can check that way first. That, that's a way to save you time. So by focusing on content, um, what you'll find is if the student is using poor quality sources, their paper won't be good. Um, and what you want to do at that point is hand it back to them. Do not take it. Do not grade it. Hand it back to them. Um, this will actually save you time. Tell them to schedule a 15-minute check-in with the librarian. If you don't know who your librarian is, um, let us know, and we can let you know. Um, and you might even send an email to the student and the librarian so that the connection can be made. 
Um, and most importantly, I think, is don't pass the student on to be someone else's problem if they're having this issue. This is really a teaching moment that you can use to the universities and students' advantage to uphold the quality of instruction and the quality of student work. Um, and as we have expectations for students, remember to set expectations for yourself and how you teach. Um, I have to do that uh, for myself, too. Uh, next slide, Lizzie. Thanks. And just a quick slide about the librarians. We call ourselves embedded librarians, and that means that we're kind of embedded within your classes. I work with a couple of you on the phone right now. Um, so we can help you by being embedded in your course and passing on research skills to your students, and we're available in person. We usually like to be in a class no less than 45 minutes, but we can go as long as an hour and a half or two hours um, for orientations or for specific um, research skills. Like we can go for database searching or topic formulation. Um, and this is an example, thank you for pulling that up, Lizzie, of a discussion board I do in uh, English 102 about evaluating sources. And in this discussion board, we briefly touch on some of the things that we talked about today. Um, so it gets students kind of critically thinking about what they're looking about online and hopefully then critically reading it and then uh, using high quality information for their assignments. But this is just an example of what something might look like in a discussion board. Um, if you already have a librarian embedded in your course, um, it's great when you support their message by making announcements and supporting um, or reiterating the concepts that the librarians are putting forth. Um, I work with several great instructors, and I know that they have put in comments to discussion boards like, um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you, how you reply to the librarian, um, or in subsequent discussion boards when they say, um, I don't think those sources are good enough. You need to use something else. Um, so come back to me with better sources, and, and we can talk more about your paper. Um, which takes us to the last slide of, um, you know, we all have a single goal. Um, I know the librarians are talking today as this presentation, but um, we really are a team here, and it takes a lot of teamwork. Information literacy isn't just a library goal but it's a CityU learning goal, and it's CULG3B, in case you're interested in that. That CULG3B is information literacy, which is what um, the, the types of instruction that, that we cover, uh, the librarians. So we can help you by being embedded in your course or by addressing faculty questions you might have about the high-quality resources and information literacy. Um, but also you guys can help us, the librarians, by reiterating concepts in your class, giving students the domain knowledge to be successful, and passing along classroom insights to the librarians. So yeah, I just want to um, finish with it takes teamwork, and um, I enjoy working with all the instructors. Um, I, I think we're a great team here at CityU, and um, I wanted to let you know we're on your team. Does anybody have any questions? Or Lizzie, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, so I don't have, thanks Jenny, I don't have too much to add. I do want to say that um, you can help us. Uh, we don't uh, get to spend all quarter with students. And you know, we may get 30 minutes here. Or uh, in really good scenarios, we get to work with them in a discussion board over the quarter. Um, but you see their papers and projects at the end of the quarter. You see what they're putting through, uh, and you see that the work that they're putting in. Uh, and so if you share with us problems you see, your common problems you see, uh, we can work towards something to do in your class. Um, we can come up with activities. We can come up with um, ways that we can improve upon that. And we're happy to do that. Um, I always say, I always tell students this, but I think it's important for faculty to know as well, uh, please bother us. <laughs> you know, um, our work is dependent on uh, students and faculty working with us. So please bother us. If you have any questions, please reach out. Um, we're more than happy to help you kind of reach these uh, information literacy goals in your class. 
Yeah, and just also to add on to that, um, we have an Ask a Librarian um, uh, page on the library. So it's library.cityu.edu, and it's in the upper right-hand side. You can go to Ask a Librarian. This isn't just for students. This is for faculty and staff. Um, so you can chat with us uh, real time. You can send us an email, or you can give us a call. Um, so Lizzie's showing you the Ask a Librarian. So please feel free to use that. Uh, that will get you to the librarian on, on reference. And then if you need to talk to a specific librarian, she can, or the, the librarian on reference can pass that on um, to whoever you want, or probably help you themselves. 